before we get to this week's episode, I want to tell you about Three Righteous Mamas, a new podcast featuring three all-American moms, one Latina, one Muslim, and one queer, who talk about the issues of the day with some of the biggest change makers and thought leaders in our world. These are three mamas who are on a mission to transform our country and celebrate the power of hope to build a better future for all of our children. Check out Three Righteous Mamas wherever you listen to podcasts. From the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State University, I'm Chris Bean. I'm Candace Watsman. I'm Jenna Spinelli, and welcome to Democracy Works. This week, we are very excited to talk with Danielle Allen, who is the James Bryant Conant University professor at Harvard, where she also directs the Safra Center for Ethics. And for purposes of this discussion, she is also the leader of two large-scale projects that look at the future of American democracy. One is Our Common Purpose from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the other is Educating for American Democracy, which is a product of several organizations that look at civics education. So these are our separate projects, but I think both born out of the same general idea, which is that we are at a period of crisis in American democracy, which we've, of course, talked about many times on this show before. But I don't know, you guys, I'm doing a lot of home renovations right now, and it it, it comes (laughs) to mind that uh, we need to kind of take this thing down to the studs. That was sort of what I took from a lot of the arguments that are in these two documents. It's the time for big, bold, transformational changes. Oh, that's an interesting metaphor. (laughs) I mean, Candace and I were talking before we hit the red button that we are in a crisis and things are precarious right now. But with every crisis comes an opportunity. And every time there's been a leap to a new plateau in terms of our conception, our living out of our democracy, it's always been premised by a crisis, right? So the Civil War amendments came as a result of the Civil War. And the Civil Rights era came as a result of riots and other forms of civil disobedience. And so this moment where things seem so dire in terms of polarization and a lack of any sense of common purpose or common identity with those in the other tribe creates a crisis and also an opportunity as well. How can we rediscover our common purpose and what are the practical means by which we get there? I think it's really appropriate that both of these reports are coming out right about at the same time. One of them, Education for Democracy, is kind of a bottom up. Let's start with the kids and let's start with educating our citizens. And then from the top down, our common purpose of how do we just need to rethink our institutions It's a multi-pronged approach to a multi-pronged problem. They're also kind of like, what can we do? Is that they touch on so many aspects of our society because each component can be a push or pull factor in our democracy. And given the fact that so many politicians understand their self-interest to be directly tied to maintenance of the status quo, the only way that things are going to change is if there is an undeniable popular support. And then the other point is, is this a crisis or not? And if it is a crisis, then how is it responsible not to address it with an appropriate level of energy and concern, big picture, I mean, if it's a crisis, this is the level at which we need to be pitching our solutions. But I think it's also important to know that democracy is on a spectrum and you can have a weak democracy, you can have a strong democracy, you can have an inclusive democracy, you can have an exclusive democracy, you can have all sorts of shapes and shades of democracy. And this one is inclined toward one where the people have a say and have more connection with their representatives. If Since we are a representative democracy, how can we close the gap? How can we ensure that people 
that their voices aren't being impeded by the rules, the institutional rules of voting, for example, that we can do things a different way in order to bring in more people and more voices. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting because when I read that, my thought was we're throwing down a gauntlet because what we need to achieve is something that has never been achieved before in human history. And, you know, this is like the Manhattan Project of Mm -hmm. democracy, right? This is that hard and that necessary, right? If we're going to continue as a democracy, this has to happen. But let no one misunderstand just what it is we're calling for and how difficult it's going to get for us human beings to get there. So listeners, if you have not already read Our Common Purpose and Educating for American Democracy, we have links in the show notes. Uh, You might want to hit pause and go peruse those either now or after the conversation with Danielle or Chris and Candace come back to reflect on them. But for now, let's go to the interview with Danielle Allen. Danielle Allen, welcome to Democracy Works. Thank you so much for joining us today. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So excited to talk with you about both our common purpose and educating for American democracy, two really big, bold, large-scale projects that you've had the opportunity to have leadership roles in. And reading through both of these reports, it seems like a common theme is that American democracy is at crossroads and inflection points, you can pick the metaphor, but now is the time for big change, not making tweaks at the margins or incremental types of change. We are at this, on the verge of this crisis point, we need big, bold actions. I'm wondering if that's a fair kind of characterization of the scope and the mission of these projects. And if that's the case, can you say more about the thinking behind it? Sure. Thank you. Yes, both reports, Our Common Purpose, which focuses on reinventing American democracy for the 21st century, and the second report, Educating for American Democracy, they both have as a core premise that we are at a turning point moment in the country. Lots of people like to think about that turning point moment as one of about sort of saving democracy or recovering democracy. I think we're better off if we can think of the job ahead as of achieving democracy. We don't really have a point in the past that we can look back to and say, oh, yes, that was it. We're all familiar with the long standing problems, for example, around race in the country and other forms of inequity and injustice. And so in that regard, we really are at a moment where we both see that our democracy is weak and that we need to achieve something that hasn't been achieved before a healthy democracy that rests on principles of full inclusion. So I think that's really what the project is. And both Our Common Purpose and Educating for American Democracy spell out key steps we can collectively take to achieve that democracy that rests on a principle of full inclusion. Right. So this is all kind of happening and out there at a time, you know, particularly in the past couple of months, we saw the insurrection on, on January 6th. We're now seeing states across the country and their legislatures making moves to restrict voting rights, largely on the premise that the election was not legitimate and there was fraud and all of these things. So I'm wondering how you think about some of these ideas to change the system and try to move things forward or reconceive it while there is seemingly this more kind of destructive behavior that's also going on. Well, our political landscape is super complicated, and I think there are a few distinctions that I would want to introduced that I think are useful for thinking about it. One is a distinction between institutionalists and insurrectionists. And then the other is a distinction between, for example, Republican Party officials and leaders and people who happen to vote Republican. I don't think that they're in the same position necessarily. So let me come to the first thing. If you take this this distinction between institutionalists And insurrectionists comes from the work of Ethan Zuckerman, and it's a distinction he's been using for some time, so it predates the events of January 6th. And the basic idea is that institutionalists are people who, over the last decade or so, 
have thought that our constitutional democracy was basically functional and that we just needed to tweak at the margins. Insurrectionists, in contrast, have thought that things were fundamentally broken and thought that we needed pretty dramatic transformation. Ethan's important point is that we have examples on right and left in both categories. So if you think of the 2016 election, for example, people expected it to be a kind of fight between two institutionalists, Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush, one from either party. Instead, what we really did get at its root was a fight between two insurrectionists, one from each side, Bernie Sanders on the left and Donald Trump on the right. And so when you see that the sort of spirit of insurrectionism does really exist across the political spectrum, what you realize is that lots of Americans, and again, it doesn't matter sort of which part of the political spectrum, have experienced real senses of disempowerment and alienation from our collective institutions over the last decade or two. And it's that really, which is the sort of, has left us with all this kind of dry tinder ready to burn. And that's really what we have to do work to repair. So that's sort of the first point that we have a real calling out from Americans of all political stripes saying, look, our institutions aren't responsive. They don't empower us. They don't give us equal voice. We need dramatic change. And our Common Purpose Report is trying to offer change in the direction of delivering those responsive, empowering institutions that give people equal voice. The report's also trying to deliver solutions that are about knitting communities back together again on the idea that empowerment flows out of connection to one another. So that's one piece. So then you have this other funny dynamic where there's this kind of broad recognition among Americans that Our political institutions aren't delivering for us, that governance is not effective and the like. Nonetheless, we have our two elite parties, you know, at each other's throats, bitterly fighting for control of these broken institutions. That fight for control over these institutions has turned into a fight over the degree of access and ease of voting. So it's this very, very sad fact that the broad American public is interested in empowerment. We can see that in all kinds of ways in how people are voting on ballot propositions and the like. But especially in the Republican Party, party leaders are seeking to control, own these broken institutions by narrowing the range of participation. So in that regard, I do think there's a really big cause of voting rights that we ought to be all pursuing. One of the Our Common Purpose report recommendations is that we introduce universal voter duty. So treat voting like jury duty, make it mandatory as it is in Australia. There's a very minimal fine if you don't vote. But if we could do that, we could leapfrog over some of the questions around degree of access and ease of access for the vote and simply reaffirm a commitment to universal suffrage and then get back to the business of actually adjusting our institutions, fixing them, transforming them so that they are actually functional and healthy and empowering for everybody. And that touches on the other kind of piece you mentioning, kind of elite buy-in and institutionalists. And I think the grassroots have already taken up the mantle on some of the causes in our common purpose, things like ranked choice voting and redistricting reform and perhaps others. But they often hit a wall when it comes to anything that they can't do directly on their own, you know, particularly in states that don't have ballot initiatives. So I'm wondering how you make the case for some of these changes to legislators in deep red states, or even those that are maybe not conservative in their political views, but maybe just biased toward the status quo? Well, I think that's a hard set of political questions. And I do think we have to work to rebuild will at the grassroots level and try to work across the ideological spectrum at the grassroots level to build a commitment to participation and universal suffrage. I think that work, achieving that, will precede our ability to change the direction that party elites are taking. So I think that there's a lot of work to be done at the level of the kind of public engagement campaign around participation, around universal suffrage. We're going to take a quick break from this week's interview to tell you about another great podcast in the Democracy Group Podcast Network. 
Politics in Question is hosted by Lee Drutman, Julia Azari, and James Walner, three experts on America's political institutions and reform. Each week on the show, they go beyond headlines and news alerts to look at some of the problems that stem from deep tensions and challenges in America's political institutions. Julia Lee and James have lively conversations that sometimes include experts from academia and beyond. They talk both about the problems in American political institutions and the possibilities for reform. They also look at what American politics could look like if citizens asked more questions about politics. You can find Politics in Question wherever you listen to podcasts. Now back to the interview. And you, I think both on our common purpose and educating for American democracy, try to model some of this coalition building and the behavior you want to see as, as far as who was involved in these committees and actually putting these reports together. Is, is that right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we spend a lot of time these days talking about polarization. And when we talk about it, we sort of seem to hope that the solution might somehow come from some kind of magic pill or silver bullet or something like that. But I don't think that's how it works. I think that at the end of the day, relationships are what give us the context for our decision making. And we actually just have to quite self-consciously build relationships where they don't exist right now. And that requires learning on all sides, on all parts, because the relationships don't exist often because we disagree so profoundly. So that means we need a kind of motivation for why we want to build a relationship, even in context of really quite stark disagreement. For me, the relevant motivation um, is really, you know, exhibited, I think, quite clearly in the pandemic. So, you know, we've just lost more than half a million people. And what, that didn't have to happen. There, From a technical point of view, the knowledge existed in the world last February of how to suppress COVID quickly and rapidly and prevent death without doing exorbitant damage to the economy. So all you have to do is look at South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, places like that to see that possibility. So in the U.S., we were not able to achieve that primarily because of the depths of our polarization. So, I mean, yes, the Trump administration contributed significantly to that problem, but they had a context of polarization that was also enabling of the dysfunctions of governance that we saw. So that polarization, which really is fundamentally at the root of the governance failure that we had through COVID, is detrimental to our lives at a very material level, very basic level. And it affects other things too. I mean, other kinds of hard problems we have to tackle, whether that's climate whether that's rebuilding opportunity that connects rural communities back to urban communities and the like, we can't really tackle those problems effectively if we don't actually reduce our degree of polarization. So that should be the motivation. The desire to tackle our hardest problems should actually motivate us to start forming relationships again, even with people with whom we disagree just quite intensely. And yeah. then you do the work. I mean, you got to figure out how you can actually kind of share space with people you really intensely disagree with. When you do that, I think you start to modulate. Everybody starts to modulate and learn together. That's a different process that I'm describing than compromise, so to speak. So there are bright lines. There are bright lines around rights protection that everybody needs to stand up for. But even with those bright lines, it is possible actually to build relationships across lines of difference and through mutual learning, start to find solutions to problems that hadn't been visible previously. Does this type of work you're describing require that everyone involved have a certain measure of good faith? I think where I see some of these things break down sometimes is you know, people on the left might say that, oh, I'm not going to try to work on, with anybody from the far right because they're conspiracy theorists or they're in some way operating in bad faith. I'm wondering how you think about some of those types of things. Well, I mean, I think it's a challenge because it's very obvious in our political universe that there are people operating in bad faith. I mean, we can see them, right? You know, sort of various kinds of disinformation campaigns, propaganda campaigns, and so forth. So the hard thing to do is to recognize that the people who are actually operating in bad faith are a very, very small minority. And so one does have to start by presuming good faith on the part of others and then work hard to discern and to have criteria for discerning 
the difference between those who truly are acting in bad faith and the others who are acting in good faith, but have a very different perspective on things. So I think in, in that regard, that's probably the first step is simply to build up criteria for discerning between those who truly are bad faith actors and everybody else. Mm-hmm. And what might some of those criteria be, do you think? Uh, that's a fair question. <laughs> I just said that. I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer because I think it's work that we need to do. I mean, how do I go about making that distinction? To some extent, I look at questions like, is a person actually producing disinformation or are they merely passing it along? I think people often pass along disinformation, for example, because they don't realize that that's what it is. So that's a very kind of different category, the people who are intentionally creating disinformation versus people who are passing it along. I mean, another key distinction is people who are explicitly and full-throatedly advocating neo-Confederacy points of view. Then there are people who are also in the same room at the same time, but haven't, in fact, themselves ever produced such articulations. I think it's important to test whether or not um, the latter category of people will walk away from the former category of people. Don't presume up front that they mean to be in that room. Let's start by giving them a chance to walk away from it. So those are the kinds of things I would do to start discerning. So I know that both Our Common Purpose and Educating for American Democracy had input from the public. In the case of Our Common Purpose, it was, you know, listening sessions. And I believe Educating for American Democracy had input from teachers throughout the country and and other school officials, perhaps. So what's your sense as far as how ready the public is for some of the reforms that you're advocating? Is it one of those things where, like we've seen, for example, with marijuana legalization or minimum wage, that the public is ahead of lawmakers as far as their support for change and for new ideas? Yes. No, I think this is the case, too, in the democracy space. And I should say for Educating for American Democracy, we also engage students in the work Yes, if you look at ballot propositions around the country, you see the public ahead of lawmakers all over the place. You see ballot propositions around campaign finance, for example. These things pass with supermajority votes. You see ballot propositions for independent redistricting commissions. You know, in California and Florida both, we saw the success of ballot propositions for restoring voting rights to people who have completed their felony convictions. And in the Florida case, we saw a disjunction between what the people voted for, including Republicans, and then what lawmakers, Republican lawmakers in the state legislature wanted to do as they sought to roll back the impact of that ballot proposition. So yes, I do think we have to recognize that the center of gravity of popular opinion is actually not necessarily well represented at the moment by where lawmakers are. I think that's actually one of our biggest political problems. And so that, for me, is why democracy reform is so important, because we really do need to open up channels that bring into elected office people who are closer to that sort of center of gravity, supermajority point of view for how we can help our society to a more healthy place. We talked on the show at the beginning of the year with the writer David Daly, who you may know from Massachusetts. One of the things he said was that we could have a situation, depending on how some of these ballot propositions go, where there becomes a substantive discrepancy between states about how democratic they are or not, as redistricting reforms and and ranked choice voting, and you know some of these things pass in in some states, but not others, particularly states that don't have ballot propositions. How concerned are you about varying levels of democracy and and the ability for democratic participation from one state to another? So over the long term, I'm not actually super concerned about it. I actually think it can be productive. So in that regard, we could think of the period that we're currently living in as something like the period between 1776 and 1787, 88, 89. So one of the things that made the Constitutional Convention as successful as it was, given the time period in which they were working and so forth, but they did achieve functional mechanisms for governance. And that success depended on the fact that the 13 states had been experimenting for a dozen years, and they had a real diversity of approaches. And there was a range of those that were more democratic with even a single unicameral structure, and then places that were less democratic. So 
That experimentation is what permitted the inventiveness of the Constitutional Convention. So I think that, honestly, a decade of really serious work to find new solutions, where even if it's only some of the states that are achieving those solutions, nonetheless, some are, will then yield ultimately a sort of broad national picture. We've seen the same thing in other areas, the expansion of rights around marriage equality, LGBTQ rights and the like really did emerge from experimentation at municipal and state levels and then a broad spreading of understanding. And then we were able to kind of complete a national framework. I think we're in a similar kind of phase with regard to democracy work. Sure. And I know that the focus of educating for American democracy is on K-12 education, but there is a a section of the report that lists some ways that that higher education can play a role. I know many of our listeners are faculty or staff at universities. Can you talk about some of the ways that they might be able to help this effort? Absolutely. I mean, I think partnership with colleges and universities will be indispensable for success. And that's about helping K through 12 educators and systems develop curricula and lessons. It's about providing professional development to K through 12 educators. So, of course, education schools are relevant there, but not just education schools. We need content experts in history, in political science, in communications, in media studies, all kinds of things, in psychology, in law. We need experts in all of those areas building out meaningful professional development opportunities for educators. My view is that every college and university in the country should be running professional development for the educators in their communities to provide that content support and expertise. So I think it's a national project, and I think there is absolutely a role for every single college and university. Just work immediately with the school districts right around you. If we all did that, we would incredibly strengthen our K-12 sector. Great. One last question for you, Danielle. So there are lots of naysayers out there when it comes to this work, both in civic education and in larger democracy reform um, more broadly. I've certainly spent the past 20 minutes or so giving you some of those naysayer arguments in this conversation. I'm wondering how you kind of keep your focus and keep your eye on that North Star, so to speak, amid all this kind of detraction and what advice you might offer to our listeners who are maybe involved in in grassroots organizations or who are trying to push for change in their town, their community, et cetera. People often ask me if I'm a pessimist or an optimist, and I say I'm not either of those things. I'm a not an optionist, by which I mean failure is not an option. So democracy, I believe, is necessary to human flourishing. People need the tools of democracy and of a healthy democracy so that they can craft not only their own lives, but contribute to crafting the life of their community. That gives empowerment And empowerment, I believe, is core to human flourishing. So it's what we need. Failure is not an option. So consequently, we're going to get it done. So that's my approach. I'm a not an optionist. That's how I keep my focus throughout. Great. Well, we will leave it there. Danielle Allen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Chris, I'm curious to know what stood out to you about either our common purpose or the Education for America yeah, that, obviously, report. Yeah. So they're both chock full of ideas and practical proposals. And all of them have a certain measure of controversy to them. But the one that resonated with me was this idea, and I think it's the first one in the, our common purpose, is to expand the House of Representatives. And I think most people will hear that and say, we can't do that. It's set. And it is set. It's set by a law that was passed in 1929. And it was passed by a Congress that was worried about demographic changes that were putting too much power in the cities. So when you hear people talking about, well, we're not a democracy, we're a republic, and that's why the Electoral College is the way it is. That's just simply not true. That decision was made by U.S. representatives and senators who were all Republican who wanted to maintain power. 
There's nothing wrong with that, but there's no reason why it cannot be changed. And if you want to make the House and the Senate both more representative, not to mention the Electoral College, one way to do that is to expand the House and make it more representative than one for every 750,000 Americans. So perhaps- What about you? One of them that stood out to me was that there is a really broad vision and understanding of citizenship and not just about the kind of, are you eligible for a passport or not, right? It's not just about the kind of rights and privileges that citizens get, but also about a sense of reciprocity among people who live in this country, generally speaking, and that it gears toward kind of a broad ethical definition of citizenship that talks about participation in common life in contributions that all sorts of people, whether they are legally citizens or not, can have a say in. And one conversation that I have with my students from time to time is, and I think this goes back, this is a similar theme as the expanding the house, is that it has not always been the case that you had to be a citizen to vote in the United States. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so you think about people who are immigrants, for example, who send their children to schools. Should they not have a say in what the school board has to say? They pay taxes too. But Mm -hmm. we have come to having a common sense that only certain people should be allowed to participate in various ways and other people should be excluded. When the fact of the matter is, is that the way that we live our lives, so it feels commonsensical, but we've had a longer history where non-citizens can vote than when they couldn't vote. And I think for a variety of reasons including a kind of neoliberal sense that we are all focused on ourselves as individuals. We just don't do that well anymore. But it's simply not sufficient. And I think you could look at our nation's current state of affairs to just convince yourselves of that, that it's simply not sufficient for us to be thinking in such a narrow frame. Mm -hmm. We have to be thinking about us and how our nation is dealing with these challenges and these crises like that. I think that that sentiment also extends to the Education for American Democracy. Nice segue, Candace. That was pro. (laughs) Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. (laughs) Well, it does. I know it does. Um, That's that's why I said it was good. There are these kind of points that they're hoping to themes, objectives. And one of them is, for example, to celebrate the compromises needed to make our constitutional democracy work, that we all have to pitch in and that we have to come to some agreement in order for us to work together. And so I think that what you're saying is alluded to as well in this kind of orientation. We need to have, we need to prioritize civics and we need to prioritize history if we're going to maintain or if we're going to improve democracy and if we're going to take steps towards achieving what we have never achieved before, a healthy, inclusive democracy. But I think our generation, just absolutely my generation, sorry, I don't mean to include you, (laughs) my generation just completely failed in terms of civic education for our children. And the idea that people are just going to pick it up by osmosis and suddenly when they're 18, they're going to know how to do it is just crazy. And so if we are going to give people this kind of responsibility as sovereigns in this government, then we have to give them the opportunity to learn what skills they need and then to practice them. And so in this document, they talk about the idea that history is important. It is essential, but it is not sufficient. And we have to take seriously our responsibility to prepare children to become future citizens. And both documents discuss this business of building relationships and teaching folks to build relationships that include people who have 
differing opinions, but shared values. And I think when we're talking about self-interest, self-interest works okay if we have shared values. Mm -hmm. If we're all kind of working toward the same things, maybe we have different ideas about how to get there. You know, all these things are arguments that people are kind of constrained to make to defend democracy. But she's like having none of that. It was just good to hear someone just like say, nope, mm -mm, this is the right answer. And if you're not on board, you're not just a problem, you're mistaken. So this is worth fighting for. And it was really nice to hear her frame it that way. So thanks to Daniel Allen. It was a great talk she gave here. We can put that in the show notes too, right? In the YouTube. Her documents are terrific. I mean, they're not her documents, but she was an essential part of them. And they're absolutely worth your time. And thanks to Candace for agreeing with me finally. And so from Courtney Institute for Democracy, I'm Chris Beam. And I'm Candace Watt-Smith. Thanks for listening. Democracy Works is produced by the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State and WPSU, Central Pennsylvania's NPR station. Our editors are Mark Stitzer, Jen Bortz, and Chris Kugler. And additional support comes from WPSU's Andy Grant, Emily Reddy, Chris Allen, and Craig Johnson. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please consider leaving us a rating and a review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.